I have a question as we begin our uh, sermon this morning, our message from the scripture. I like to sometimes ask questions to keep you thinking about uh, some of the topics. Uh, this is an introductory question for what we're about to cover, of course, this morning. And it's, uh, it's kind of a, you know, a, a kind of a minor question, perhaps, but I think it's worth considering. And that is this. Was the resurrection really necessary? I uh, kind of think people say, well, yes, okay, let's close in prayer and we're done. And, uh, you know, this could be a, the shortest sermon in history. But it's really not a minor question. I say that kind of tongue in cheek, obviously, because uh, a very critical question. And uh, one that the scripture actually is going to address this morning. You would think that by now, the believers, since uh, we're studying a book called First Corinthians, by now, the people there would not have any question about this. That this should be a settled fact in everybody's mind, should it not, about uh, the importance of the resurrection, of the, the relevance of it. But uh, we will find that, uh, in, as we look at the text this morning, it really is a concern to some who are believers. And how could that be? And are there people here today, for example, who may uh, secretly in their heart, perhaps, uh, be wondering about that? And maybe uh, this morning's message will, uh, will reach your ears and your heart about this question. Now, two weeks ago, I always like to back up just a skosh. Uh, the skosh is kind of a little, right? Uh, to just so that we have the setting of where we are and we don't get completely lost because a lot of us have difficulty remembering what we ate for breakfast this morning. Some of us didn't eat breakfast this morning. Uh, but, you know, remembering what happened last Shabbat or is, is difficult enough. Go two weeks ago since we spoke, then I had a chance to, to continue the message here because we had the bat mitzvah, which was a joy. And so, anyway, I just want to remind you a little bit about what happened uh, a couple of weeks ago. Do you remember now? Now, okay, rewind your mind and remember, as uh, for those who are visiting here, may be wondering, kind of lost here, what are we doing? Well, we've been working our way through the book of First Corinthians, and I called it First Californians because it seems to be very applicable to our lives in this world today where we live. And I think all of you would agree that a uh, number of the things that are talked about in that in this letter of Paul to the congregation at uh, Corinth uh, are relevant indeed in many things but we won't review all of them now because Chris doesn't like me to do that and I don't want I'm just, just kidding I'm just, just, I'm just yeah he's shaking his head saying why you mentioned anyway so we try to keep this short but remember in, uh, in chapter 15 we're all the way up to 15 there's only 16 chapters in the book so we're nearing the end of already it's almost like no, <laughs> right? No, but we're not in any rush through God's word. Nobody would accuse us of rushing through the word of God, and uh, I think you would agree. Uh, but last, uh, two weeks ago, when we were covering uh, this, uh, the opening verses in chapter 15, uh, we men made mention of, of uh, some verses that delineate what the Apostle Paul, no, no less a person than the Apostle Paul, he calls the gospel. And as you recall, it was in verses uh, 3 and 4 are said to be, historians have looked at this and, uh, and theologians over the years, and decided that the very beginning verses of chapter 15 do include the earliest account extant of what was considered the gospel. This is, the, you know, as we've been moving through 1 Corinthians, I've been looking forward, not in a rush, but looking forward to this point because chapter 15 to me is like the, the pinnacle of the book of 1 Corinthians. It has so much uh, in it that is to be savored and meditated on, but uh, not that the other chapters don't have good things, but 15 is like the highlight. And we are here in 15, so I just want to not rush through 15 at all. But in 15, at the very beginning, we have this uh, definition by Paul about this being the gospel. And he, these two verses are often thought of that way. 
He says in verse, we, and we reviewed these, I won't spend a lot of time, just a little bit to kind of rewind your tapes and get you where we were. For I delivered to you as the first importance, that's the most important thing of all, what I also received, not that I received it from men, but remember, he received it from Galatians. The one explains how he received his revelation directly from the Lord. So that, that's what he received. For uh, This is what I received, that Messiah died for our sins. And in accordance with the scriptures. A little slightly different translation than the New American has. It has according to the scriptures. And I think that the text actually, the ESV translates it a little bit more meaningfully when it says in accordance with the scriptures. Meaning not that necessarily specific texts in the Tanakh, but perhaps the entire Tanakh according to scriptures. In accordance with that. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, and again, in accordance with scriptures. And we often call this, this is this particular section, the last part of uh, chapter, uh, verse 3, and also all of verse 4, we often refer to that as the gospel. We say, there it is. He died, he was buried, and he's raised. Isn't that the gospel? And as you recall, because you're very good students and remember all this, are you not? Right? That uh, two weeks ago, I made the point that there's more to the gospel. It's, it's what I call hidden right in front of us because Paul continues on. He continued on in verses 5 through 8, as you recall. Also, we, we covered that. And he continues on with this list of witnesses. And he says in six different, he cites six different witnesses, all of whom are ancient, except for the last one. And he appeared to Cephas, which is Kepha or Peter, and then to the twelve, another appearance. And then after that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. We didn't spend a whole lot of time on this fascinating sidelight for a home study is... How do we know about the 500? Was it 500? Uh, is there another reference in scripture about the 500? And the answer is, this is the only place that specifically mentions the 500, but there are suggestions in other texts that the Lord did appear to large groups of believers. This could have been one of those. And so um, the suggestion that it's the, this is the only place it's mentioned, therefore it's not uh, historically reliable. You know, I have that uh, very... Um, strong theological word to apply to that concern and that is baloney. See, there are other texts that talk about this, but we won't take the time this morning. But okay, so he appeared to more than 500, then he appeared to James, better known as Yaakov, and the, the Lord's half-brother, and then to all the, all the apostles, not just uh, the uh, 11, which are talked about here, or the 12. And last of all, he said, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also, uh, to me also. And what has Paul said? We talked about what he meant, untimely born, that he was kind of late. The word actually means that it was a miscarriage, an abortion almost, that happened to Paul, that he missed the boat. He, was, he only came to know the Lord after, and so his timing of his birth, he didn't get a chance to witness the Lord's ministry. We know that. He came to faith, and in fact, was opposed to the faith. And when he came, all of Damascus, we covered all that in the book of Acts studies. But this... This whole portion, these verses, these next four verses, all constitute part of the gospel. Why? Because the appearance, the appearance of the Lord after his burial and death is so key to the gospel. This is all about the resurrection. If you pause and think about it for a minute, you say, my goodness, you know, dying, that was a pretty important part of the gospel, just in passing. Buried, well, that, you know, confirms the fact that he actually died. And then raised, in one word, you think that that's it. But the appearance, the fact that it wasn't just some thought that we heard, oh, we heard the Lord was raised and went off to heaven. No, no, it's not the way... Not to what the Lord did. After he was raised, he appeared to... Here's six different examples that are, that are presented. That you may have reason and faith. Your faith is based on solid evidence. 
the Lord is all about, evidence, we have much evidence to believe. Those who do not believe are usually because they've never examined the evidence. You know, when I came to faith, it seemed to me the text spoke dramatically to me. And, and I placed faith in the Lord just purely on the text of His Word. But as the, time, as the years went on after that, what did I do? I'm an engineer. What did I do? <laughs> evidence. Okay, let me look it up. Let me see about it. How would I answer that? What about this? Evidence. evidence. And as I re the more I researched God's Word, the stronger my faith grew. Because God's Word is filled with evidence. Most people rarely take the time to even read it. That's why I think most of the world are, are not believers. By many, Some claim to be believers, but I wonder if they've really read the text. That's what I like to do with Ben David. I want us to stay close to his word because his word is truth and life. And from that, praise God. Amen. Here we are talking about the essence of the essence, so to speak, the, the main thing of the main part of the main part. Now, as we continue from these verses throughout and, and continue on in chapter 15, which has over 50 verses in it, so we're going to be here for a while. Um, the appearance of the risen Messiah, Paul just said that he, after, all, after all of that, he appeared to me, one untimely born, he said. The appearance of the risen Messiah to Paul was itself kind of a resurrection from the dead for him. Why? Because he was not a believer. He was headed to you know where at that time. And we'll see his comments, his own comments on that very uh, point in just a moment. But for him, it was life from death. And the image of an appearing and a risen Messiah, the fact that you could see him, fits Paul's theme of God's power giving spiritual life to those that are otherwise spiritually dead. And finally, we'll see that Paul's own sense of unworthiness which he just intimated here, one untimely born, Paul's own sense of unworthiness was overcome by the power of God. Looking ahead now and moving on to verse, the, the, the text for today, chapter 15, verses 9 through 20, we begin with, chapter, with verse 9, which says, For I am the least of the apostles. Now this is Paul just kind of looking in the mirror and saying, who am I? And the humility here is, is just wonderful and touching, and, and it just shows. Here's that Apostle Paul, you might think that, that after all that this man has been through, that he might at least recognize that, hey, you know what, I'm doing pretty good here. A lot of people are coming to faith, you know, I must be somebody. Not at all. This never went to Paul's head. I am least of the apostles. And why does he say that? What does he mean least? How can you be high least? What do you mean? Do we have a hierarchy? No. He says because, because of this. He goes on to explain it. Because, and not fit to even be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God, which is what your text says. I have pointed out before, and I'll mention it again because it's worth uh, remembering, for the, especially if those that hadn't heard it, uh, then I would be remembering, that this text is somewhat misleading. Misleading why? What do you think of when you think of the Church of God? You think of today's Church of God. That's not, that's not what Paul has in mind when he wrote here. Why? The church of God, which today is filled with many Gentile believers and wonderful believers, that's not nothing but, but good things to say about these, but, but the church of God that was talked about then was really a kehila of God. It was a Jewish group that Paul was persecuting. He left Jerusalem with papers in hand so he could go into the synagogues in Damascus and arrest those who were Jewish believers trying to present the information about Yeshua. 
and, and bringing Jewish people, quote, away from their faith in Moses or their, whatever their faith was, however you call it. So the, even call it the church of God is deceptive because today when you think of that, people think, oh, listen, oh, look at that. Paul was persecuting the church. Look at that. He was after all the believers, Gentiles and Jews alike. Right? Wrong. Not the case. He was out after the Jewish people. Those are the only ones he had authority over. Those are the ones he brought back in chains and, uh, to Jerusalem. And that's who he was after, the Kehillah of God. But by, he takes no, <laughs> but despite his best efforts to persecute the, the Kehillah of God, by the grace of God, I am what I am now, is what he's saying. You see, he would not have been who he is now were it not for God's hand upon him. We know that. And his grace toward me, the fact that he turned Paul around and turned him into, to come to faith in the very people that he was persecuting, he said, by that by his grace toward me, it was not in vain. It was not useless. It, did not, it was not of none effect. It, it had an impact on him. It wasn't just that God turned him around, but that it did more than that. In turning him around, I labored, he says, even more than all of them, even more than all of the other apostles that he's referring to, because he's putting himself, comparing himself to the other apostles. I am least of the apostles. And the them there is the other apostles. But I labored even more than all of them, lest you think that now Paul is finally saying, you know what? I did a lot. Attaboy, Paul. Not, not for a moment. Before the sentence even ends, he goes on to say, yet not I but the grace of God with me who accomplished whatever he did. Who does he give credit to for what happened? The Lord. So should we. If we, do, if we accomplish any good thing for God, it's not because of our best efforts, but because the grace of God working through us. Amen. I'm humbled to be able to just see this in action. And here's Paul demonstrating it, living it. So then, whether it was I or they, whether it was this apostle or the other apostles, so we preach and so you believed. Now you may, he's explaining here how one comes to faith, you see, through the word of God. But it's God's grace that does it. It's the Holy Spirit that quickens it to anybody's heart. I always tell people who say, you know, I brought someone to faith. I've had so many people come to faith because... Of... No, 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 you did nothing. I'm sorry to disappoint. This is how much credit you get for that, you see. God gets the credit because it's the power of the Spirit that convicts anybody of faith. You share the word. That's your part. And that's what I say about Ben David, we are, as a congregation, our goal to, is to bring the gospel to the Jew first and also to the, the Gentile, the Greek, and literary. But the point is that we present all the information that we can. We try to remove what I call the suitcases in the aisle. That's the airplane engineer in me. Takes the suitcases in the aisle out so that people can come face to face with the Lord. Then it's his problem. I'm not going to bring them to the Lord. I'll bring them face to face to the Lord and let the Lord deal with them. And deal with them he will. So whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Notice the believed is in the past tense. What about preach? Present tense. They continue to preach. Preach is meant to be an ongoing thing. Continues to do that. So whether it was the other apostles or I... That's what we do. We preach the word of God, and then you came to faith. Now, Paul, I just interrupt this, the flow here for a moment. Paul is going to address a problem that some Corinthians were still struggling with. Now, remember, this is a group of believers, right? I mean, he left them there. He stayed there for a year and a half, and 
you know, he trained them and started them off and gave them teaching and he wrote them letters that we know this is not the first letter, even though it says 1 Corinthians. It's an old whole story. If you were here at the beginning, you know the story on that. Now, Paul addresses a problem that some Corinthians were still struggling with. Are you ready? Messiah's resurrection. Well, how could they be believers, you say? Well, they were believers, but they were struggling with the resurrection of Messiah. This is pretty amazing because in the society of that day, as it turns out, most of the, a lot of the people, the Romans and the Greeks, had a sense of an afterlife. But their sense of the afterlife was not what the gospel is teaching because their sense of the afterlife was a, 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 disemb a, a disembodied a spirit that survives after the body dies. Those who believed in an afterlife believed that's what it would be, spirits floating around. Maybe with harps, I don't know what, but they were, I don't know how they could hold a harp. They, but uh, that was their position. And yet here, here are the Corinthians who have come to faith in the Lord and some, not all, but some are struggling with a possible, what do you mean a resurrection? What's, what, what, how could that be? Let's go on and look at the text here. Now, if Messiah is preached, Paul says, now, now let, me, let me help you through this that you're struggling with. So he's going to address this for them because he knows this is kind of a critical point in our faith. And it actually might touch your hearts and minds as well today because maybe there are times that you wondered about this too and he wants to address this problem. Now, if Messiah is preached, and by the way, Messiah a word that appears 12 times in, the, in these next 12 verses. He has uh, nowhere in here does he mention Yeshua. It simply talks about Messiah. Messiah, Messiah. It's all about Messiah. Interesting how Paul does that. doesn't use uh, the name Yeshua in here at all. He just says, if Messiah. That's because of the, the, the mindset of who Messiah was. They didn't know his name necessarily before he came and appeared. Some suggestions in scriptures of what it might have been. But... If Messiah is preached, if Messiah is preached that he had been raised from the dead, if this was part of our preaching, in other words, now he comes to the heart of the question, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? How is it you can believe that Messiah, that, and, and, and trust that Messiah was raised, and yet say, uh, I don't believe in resurrections. There's, a, there's something that doesn't fit here. How, how can you say that? Because what's going to happen is that you're going to have your foot in the boat and the dock at the same time and that boat's moving. It ain't going to be good. Some Corinthians were apparently having trouble believing that our bodies could be restored to what I call mint condition after death, undergoing death and decay. See, they had it in their mind that when you say resurrection, that you're brought back to life looking exactly like you look now. Same body has just been restored. Now, they're all familiar with what happens to a body when it dies. Some of them, some of the bodies are pretty decimated even before they die, because that may be the reason for their death. We don't talk about that. I think you probably can imagine. We all hear about some pretty terrible ways that people lose their lives. And so the bodies are not in terribly great shape. So the, the concept of that body being put back together, even if it wasn't trampled by an elephant or, or something you know, that happened to them, a building fell on them, or, you know, or, or a spear went through them, you know, some things that, that, that were really pretty ugly. The idea of, that, of making that back the way it was is hard for them to understand. How, how, what, is that what God's going to do? They were struggling with that. They doubted the physical resurrection was possible. How could that be? Look at what condition the, the, the dead's body is in. Why are you even talking about resurrection here? My goodness, you ever looked in one of those tombs? How about those uh, you know, who were, uh, you know, who uh, buried the, the dead and saw what happened? Not a pretty picture. They doubted that. 
And when we get to verse 35, which we're not going to do today, because we'll be here for a long time. In verse 35, Paul will explain what kind of body we will have. It's not what they were thinking. And that's key to the whole discussion here. Paul is going to talk when we get there, verse 35. If you're looking ahead, you're not paying attention here, right? So you, I knew I'd lose him when I'd do that. Verse 35, and then the verses that follow, Paul will explain that the body that we will have is what's called an imperishable body. It's a spiritual body. It's not the body that you have now. How will I know it's you then? I'm guessing name tags. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how it's going to. I don't know. It probably looked like you. Somehow we'll know one another. Some of us are hoping for a whole new body that's going to be really neat. And uh, I've got to think that God is, uh, is, is thinking way ahead of you on all that. But it, whatever it is, it won't be like the body that you have now. That may be good news to a lot of you. And uh, in what follows now, in this text that follows, responding to this question is the point of what Paul is all about from now on in this chapter. What follows is a, in the, as the beginning of this discussion is what I call an, an ad absurdum. It means a, an argument to show how, uh, you know, it's, it's an argument that shows how absurd it would be uh, if, uh, and how, uh, uh, how ridiculous it is to think and, uh, that our, our faith and how futile it would be to our faith if there was no resurrection of the dead at all. How absurd. How could we possibly maintain anything that we call our, you know, our, our believing faith if there was no resurrection? Paul's now going to examine this. And you've read the, I hope you've read this section because it's a little confusing in uh, many of the translations. And so uh, we'll try to go through it at a reasonable speed and just catch the essence of it without getting lost in it. So here, here we begin. But he says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, which is what your, you Corinthians or some of you are thinking, not even Messiah has been raised. If there is no resurrection, nobody's been raised, right? And if Messiah has not been raised watch out, then our preaching has been of no, of no effect, no real effect, no value. Your faith is also in vain because you're, you're believing in something that is not true. Because it includes the, the resurrection as part of the faith. And if you're believing this and, that, and nobody's resurrected, well then, so much for your faith. Even more, we... Apostles are to be, be found witnesses of God, false witnesses of God. Why? Because we testify against God that he raised Messiah, if he didn't raise, if Messiah, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. In other words, if we said that God raised the Messiah and there is no resurrection and therefore Messiah was not raised, then we're making up stories about what God did because he didn't do that. For if, you, if the dead are not raised, not even Messiah is raised. Wow. And if Messiah has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. This is, this is pretty heavy duty. He's forcing the people in Corinth to examine the thought pattern that has led them to believe, to reject the concept of resurrection and saying, listen, how absurd is that? How absurd? Because everything that we've said falls apart if there is no resurrection. Then those who have fallen asleep, which is a euphemism for died, they, those who have fallen asleep believing in, I put those words in so you understand what it is, believing in Messiah, have perished. And by the way, so will you. If that's the case, if we have hoped and said that Messiah was, was good for us in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied because we have bought into a lie. 
that he has, he will guide you and lead you and direct your, your path and instruct you in this life only. If that's all it is, you've bought into a lie. Because that's not our claim. But if that's all Messiah is able to do, give you instruction for living this life, we are most to be pitied because we get together and worship somebody who misled us. But now, this is, I didn't want to end it on verse 19, pardon me. Didn't want to leave you there all week. But now, and those words, by the way, in the Greek are very strong. It's unusual, but. It has, but now in the Greek. Is, whenever that's used, it turns out those, those words in the Greek, it always implies God's revelation, strong revelation about something important in, in the text. And Paul uses that right here. But now, Messiah has been raised from the dead. He has been raised. And the first fruits of those who are asleep, the Jewish thinking in Paul's mind, the first fruits, the feast of first fruits, as we all know here in our Messianic congregations, not so well known in the congregation, in the church, because first fruits just sounds like, oh, he's the first, first part. No, it's not. It's more than that. It has to do with God's plan of, uh, of his uh, Moadim and his talking about how he, de he designed from the beginning these special times to tell us in advance what he would be doing. And, and his resurrection, Messiah's resurrection, is the first fruits, many implying, by the way, don't miss this, many more to come. That's important. <laughs> we don't want to miss that. If we missed that, we missed a lot. No, Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Was the resurrection really necessary? Boy, yes, the resurrection proved, this is key, it proved that Messiah had conquered death. You know, it's one thing to tell somebody about something. It's another thing to prove it to them. When Yeshua rose from the dead, he had promised before, I lay down my life and I have the power to take it up. You remember that text? So, but that's one thing to say. It's another thing to do it. Resurrection proved that Messiah had conquered death. And because of that, he therefore is alive today and able to keep the promises he made to us. Otherwise, we can go home now. There's no reason even to be here. I want to share a story with you. It's a true story. It happened uh, some three decades ago. Three decades ago. And some of you may actually have heard, this is not the first time this story has been related, but it was so relevant to what we're talking about this morning. And, I, and I've thought about this, this particular story for years. It was one of the, uh, it, it came from a sermon by a gentleman named uh, Tony Campolo, who some of you may have heard of. But it was about three decades ago. So I'm going to guess that there are some of you here who have not heard about it. Or have at least forgotten it. I've heard a lot of sermons in my life. This was the best one I've ever heard, still is. And uh, I want to share just the last seven minutes of that. And if you haven't heard the whole message, let me know. Because I've uh, searched far and wide and finally found a copy of the original. There are some other versions of it floating around on the internet and uh, looked and found them too and listened to them and said, yeah, it's pretty close to the original, but it's not quite right. That doesn't sound right. It's missing some parts. Some part of anyway, I found the original. I want to share this with you. It's a true story that happened, as I said, about three decades ago at, uh, at a black church in Philadelphia. Now, I hope Nobody here is going to get offended by my terminology because we have political correct language. 
but that was not the case when the story was shared, okay? And so uh, just go with me this morning, will you? Okay. And so we know about Tony Campolo, perhaps you don't, I just mentioned that he, he was a white pastor at a black church, which is a fascinating thing. What would a guy like that, he was a sociologist and he was a little different. And so he fit in nicely at this church. It was a fascinating story about that. I won't get lost in that. But um, he, was a, he was a pastor at this black church in Philadelphia. And on, in this church, on every Good Friday, once a year, they had a preach-off. And all the pastors, there were more than one, it was a church of, of I don't know, over 1,500 people, I guess. They had a number of people on staff, pastors and so on. And every Good Friday, is David here? David Mays here somewhere? David, I just wanna, is David Mays on here? Okay, so I won't have a problem because he does uh, the, the, the crucifixion was on Friday, different day, but we're not going to argue about that. Let's assume Friday was the day of the crucifixion. All right? We're going to, a lot of grace involved in this. Okay, so, so um, every Good Friday each year they had this preach off and the, the pastors would all take turns preaching. This is a long service. They would take turns preaching, and the goal was to see which one could partly, and not only just to bring a message and a series of messages, but to see who could do the best job, who could stir the people up the most, who could fire them up the most on Good Friday. What an opportunity. And so one year, Tony, who was one of the, pa the pastors, uh, he was scheduled to preach next to last. To see, they had the senior pastor there, and he, was, his, he drew a straw that was uh, the next to last one to preach that year. And... Uh, and so he was all ready to, to start preaching. And uh, I just want to mention that, as you may have guessed, and some of you know for sure, that black churches are not like white churches. See, in black churches, people are a, a lot more involved with the service, shall we say. They tend to be a lot more emotional about things. Amen. And they let you know it. And when you're preaching, when your preaching is good, you know, really doing, doing, doing well in, in a black church, they, they let you know it. And if it isn't so good, they let you know that too. <laughs> Pray for them. In Tony's, church, in Tony's church, the deacons all sat in the front row. And as the pastor of the day or the, was preaching, the... Uh, the deacons would sometimes shout out, they'd listen for a while and shout out, maybe, you preach, you preach. And uh, if you were doing really well, that might change to, keep going, keep going. A little accent here. <clears throat> you don't get that in a white church, usually. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> usually. Instead, in most white ch churches, you get people looking at their, their uh, watches to see what time it is and saying, stop already, stop, you know. But in Tony's church, the women in the black church there had their own way of letting you know that you were starting to connect with them. You see, if, as you were preaching, they started hearing it and they thought, oh, this is good. They would kind of raise their hand and say... Well, 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 and you'd know that you were connecting with them, and they were starting to move. So Tony began his message, he began this message, uh, and, uh, and by his own admission, he was good. And they got gone, and pretty soon he was hearing, well... Well, well, <laughs> and the more they got going, the better he got, and the better he got, the more they got going, and he got better and better, and he got so good, he says, he wanted to take notes on himself, <laughs> and so he came to the end of this message, and the place went crazy. People went bananas. And so he sat down next to the pastor and he looked at him and, 
And the pastor looked at him and said, <clears throat> you did all right, boy. And Tony thought to himself, I hate it when he calls me boy. <laughs> so Tony said to him, pastor, and in, in black churches, again, these things are, people tend to be uh, not like a white church. You know, there's no white church. You would say, somebody said, you know, great job. They would say, to God be the glory, right? Not in a black church. They might say something like that. Uh, they're a little more honest. And so Tony said to him, Pastor, I think you can top that. <laughs> and so the pastor looked at Tony. He laughed. And in a very deep voice, which I cannot reproduce, but I'll try. He said, son, 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 you just sit back and you watch. And the pastor got up there, and for the next 45 minutes, <laughs> Tony had never seen a man blow a place apart as well as this pastor did. He simply blew that place apart. And the sermon was a very simple one, a very simple sermon. And here it is. It's Friday. Sunday's coming. Amen. That's it. That's all it was. It's Friday. Sunday's coming. So the pastor got up and started out. It's Friday. It's Friday. Jesus is on the cross. He's dead. Gone. No more. But that's Friday. Sundays are coming. And someone shouted, Well, well. And he said, You could begin to feel him take off. Friday, he said. Friday, Mary's crying her eyes out. And the disciples are running in every direction like sheep without a shepherd. No hope in the world. That's Friday. Friday. Sundays are coming. Keep going, someone said. Keep going. And he kept going. Friday. It's Friday. Pilate's washing his hands. The Roman soldiers are strutting around with their spears in their hands and their swords on their sides. But that's Friday. Sundays are coming. It's Friday, and those forces that oppress... You see, it works. It's Friday, and those forces that oppress the poor and make people suffer and cry and leave them hopeless and in despair, those forces are in control. But that's because it's Friday. Sundays are coming. It's... It's Friday. Satan's dancing a little jig and he thinks he rules the world. And all the institutions are all at his command and governments do his bidding. And businesses do his work. And everything is in his control. But that's because it's Friday. Sundays are coming. Amen. See, it does work. And he went on and on like that for almost an hour. And after that time, he had Tony so worked up <laughs> that he was more tired than the pastor was. <laughs> and at the end of the sermon, at the end of the sermon, after playing that theme over and over and over again, that we are the people of God called to invade every sector of society, knowing that we are the greatest power 
the greatest revitalizing, renewing power that can change everything and everyone. He built them up and built them up with Friday, Sunday's coming, Friday, Sunday's coming. He came to the end of that message and the place was wild. Finally, he just yelled at the top of his lungs, Friday! And everyone in the place yelled back, Sundays are coming! <laughs> and that's it, folks, you see. Keep on! <laughs> that's the ultimate message. That's the ultimate message. We are the ones with the good news, the gospel. And it really is good news. And the good news is this. It's Friday. Amen. Let's close in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, you are an awesome God. And we, we delight to carry your message to this lost world who needs you so desperately, but most of them don't even know it. You have so much for them, Lord, and, and they're wandering around, they're just lost. Lord, energize us. Give us boldness. Give us wisdom. Give us yet sensitivity. Give us the words to say. In your grace, Lord, make us effective to bring people to know you. Because, Lord, the good news is that you are the sovereign and master commander of this universe. And you have the answer to all problems. And, Father, you are the only one with that answer. So, Father, I thank you for this time as we look once again in your word and we hopefully hear from you. May it uh, embolden us in the days and years ahead to use uh, what you have given us uh, to glory, to honor you and to bring glory to you. Father, we thank you for that. Thank you for bringing us into the light. We would be lost without you. You are the one who called us, and Lord, we just take a moment now in our lives to say thank you for that. May we share that, that good news with those around us. And we give you all the praise and the glory for what you do. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.